Welcome to Aggie Fly Talk, where we sit down with the officers of the Texas A&M Fly Fishing Club and talk fly fishing, conservation, community outreach, and listen to the stories our guests have to share. We hope you enjoy the show, and please remember to subscribe and donate to the club. Welcome back to Aggie Fly Talk. I'm your host, Joseph Lopez, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Sam Vassar, um, our fundraising chair for the Texas A&M Fly Club. Welcome, yeah. Sam. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me on here. It's, it's good uh, to be back. Um, it's been a while since we've done a podcast. Um, we, we had a, our Christmas break. I'm sure you did some fishing over Christmas break oh, and stuff yeah. like that. But um, yeah, let's get right into it. Uh, we have some things to cover um, as far as the club goes before we get into an introduction about uh, how you got into fly fishing and uh, Alaska. We got some cool stuff to cover there. Oh yeah. Um, so first things first, um, have some better better weather this year or this spring, I should say. Um, we got some recent rainfall the past couple of weeks, so things are looking up as far as fishing goes around here. Oh yeah, white um, bass are gonna be. It's gonna running be, up into the creeks for sure for sure it's gonna be fun um but yeah um, we had our first meeting this thursday it went very well about 10 to 12 uh people showed up but um let's let's actually start off with two you know we have new officers this this semester i'm no longer president um i'm the event coordinator our, our new president is ben gross close um if some of y'all are familiar with him but great uh, fisherman from Rockport, um, and uh, he's, he's doing great so far. So I can't wait to see what he brings for the club. Um, on top of that, we did uh, get a new TU Costa 5 coordinator. So uh, Libby left her role, and we now have uh, Mr. Cliff Watson, a uh, very cool um, individual. He, he graduated from CU Boulder, so he was in the fly fishing club there. Very active with TU Costa Five, so I'm I'm stoked to see what plans he has for this semester. Oh, yeah. Um, what's next? What's next? Trout Fest. Trout Fest is in two weeks. We're super excited um, to be back again, supporting GRTU, supporting uh, everybody there. Really, uh, I think it's a good way to network with with people and uh, check out exhibitor booths. Yeah, man, I'm very excited for that. It's gonna be my first. Uh every time going to trout fest and yeah i'm stoked that's gonna be cool yeah, man. i'm very excited to meet some people yeah and see that new film that they're coming out with yeah that's gonna be sick yeah. yeah um and then we have the texas fly fest and brew fest uh that's um in mesquite uh texas and that is the 24th to the 25th so the weekend following trout fest but another great opportunity to network uh to meet uh outfitters to meet guides um industry professionals yeah. stuff like that um we're actually helping tear down the event too so helping out uh bo beasley and his staff there yeah but i'm super stoked um all right sam let's let's get into man how you got into fly fishing um we'll talk about alaska right after that but yeah what was your first experience fly fishing yeah so my first experience fly fishing was actually in uh, telluride colorado um we had been up there for a ski trip uh, over spring break, probably, goodness, 10 years ago now. Okay. And uh, since then, we we went out and fly fished with a uh, guide that day. And, man, he taught, taught us how to cast, get a little bit of the basics down. and uh, But the river we were on that day, we caught at least 60 fish total. It was <laughs> awesome. wild. And just after that, it was like an instant i was on to fly fishing i was all about it i went ordered myself brand new gear got some just the cheapest stuff orvis had to offer and just yeah. started practicing fly fishing in my backyard really yeah yeah um, now you grew grew up in colorado or no no i grew up in uh, houston texas Houston. Okay. so not really like a fly fishing hub or anything <laughs> like that like there's not a big recognition of that kind of community there yeah. but uh in colorado i was able to get kind of introduced to that and just super on fire for it and just started practicing in my backyard practicing casting into my pool and just trying to figure it out i broke off so many flies on the top of my roof <laughs> oh my lord man <laughs> the roof flies now yeah, right <laughs> the roof flies now definitely man that's, that's cool but uh man. then i just started progressing from there started fly fishing in local ponds yeah. some country clubs around my uh, house and just catching bass um yeah. and that really got me into it even more and then uh started taking smaller trips mm -hmm. started focusing our trips on fly fishing right. and uh ended up going to 
uh, England to fly fish for Atlantic salmon. Yeah. Went up to Alaska probably five or six years in a row. Just that's awesome. really enjoying it, catching yeah. salmon, all of the above. And that's what really sparked me going forward into becoming a fly fishing guide up in Alaska. That's awesome. Yeah. So I want to touch on some, I know people, uh, that's for speaking like our officers, a lot of their dads, uh, you know, either taught them or was in the process of when they were learning. How was it for you? Were, were you fly fishing by yourself? Did your dad yeah, tag man, along with you? He would tag along with me. Okay. He wasn't really super into it as much as I was, but after that, that trip in Telluride, we, I was really fired up for it, but my passion really sparked his passion his for passion. it too. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was never really involved in fly fishing. He did a lot of fishing back in the day and mm -hmm. grew my passion for just fishing in general with in conventional, general. uh, gear, but, uh, he never was into fly fishing much, but okay. yeah. really sparked that. We, we used to fish out in, uh, Pine Cove, uh, family camp. Oh, uh, we'd go yeah. to a family camp there every, cool. uh, every summer for a week. And we'd go out in the morning, some mornings and take the little, uh, paddle boat out and <laughs> try and fish and out there i, I actually landed my pb bass so i caught a 13 pounder out there that's man. how it happens it's unexpectedly wild. yeah very right. unexpectedly well cool man yeah and and i mean i'm sure you can attest to this you know both of the different types of fishing are, are so cool right you know you have trout fishing and you have bass fishing they oh, all have wow. their unique uh I guess characteristics on like you know how you fish for them, yeah. uh, what you use to fish for them. So you encompass all of fly fishing when you go from warm water to cold water, Big even salt sometimes. Yeah. yeah, and flowing water to still water. To still water. It's, yeah, yeah. It's so. just so much different. And I gotta say, bass fishing with a popper—that's where it's <laughs> that's at, y'all. It's, yeah. it's that's. You can't beat it. Yeah. Big top yeah. water blow ups, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's something that I, I miss, man. I hope we can get back on that this summer. Definitely. Alaska, man. Let let's let's touch on that. So you, you know, you, you go up there and uh and, and what happened after that? You go on a trip up there and stuff like that? Yeah, so I've been going up to Alaska, like I said, for probably six or seven summers in a row. Okay. And uh, I really learned it's not super complicated on what kind of gear you're using and how you target the fish. Um, but I learned all that over mm -hmm. those years and, uh, we actually went up, uh, one of our trips was to stay at a lodge. My dad, he was wanting to kind of stay in a singular location that mm -hmm. on that trip, he's wasn't wanting to move around, do a camping trip. We did a fly out, uh, like rafting trip where we camped oh, okay. out in the wilderness for three days, but that's hard to do, you know, it is, especially yeah. upper six or middle sixties, but, yeah, uh, getting older, yeah. yeah, yeah, but, um, we went to this lodge, Alaska Trophy Adventures Lodge, um, where I work at now, and uh, we were in, went up as a client um, just to go fishing for the week, and I really enjoyed it. We were guided by the head guide, Patrick uh, McIntyre, and uh, he really like sparked my passion for that river specifically. And okay. uh, I talked with him about you know possibly coming up there the next summer as a uh, camp staff just to clean dishes just to be in Alaska for right. the summer and getting paid to do that. Yeah. It'd just be ideal. Um, but from there I talked with the, the owner and he said, Hey, hit me up over uh, winter break, uh, next this winter break. And uh, I'll see if I have any positions available for you. So around June or well, I sent him a, uh, <laughs> a text on, uh, or an email on, uh, July 1st or, or yeah. No, sorry, January 1st, January 1st, the first of the year. Um, and I was like, hey, uh, I'm reaching out, just going to see if y'all have any positions available. And he said, no, we don't have any camp staff positions available, but we do need some extra guides to come out and help when the, we're really busy during the yeah. summer. Um, so I was like, yeah, man, that's definitely what I'd rather do, become a guide. You know? wow. And he said, now, to become a guide up there, you're going to have to get your captain's license, yeah. which allows you to take people out on uh, on a boat out there because we're driving jet, uh, jet boats up and down the river right. to get to our spots that we're trying to fish at. Um, now, for those that don't know, ATA is on the Alagnac, the Alagnac okay. River. It's in uh, western Alaska uh, in the Bristol Bay area. It's actually located within Kat no, Katmai National Park. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, so... He basically said, you got to get your captain's license. And uh, there's this course up in Alaska that they teach that will give you a captain's license that restricts you to certain rivers Western. in Western Alaska. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I was like, yeah, man, I'll fly up there. So I bought myself a plane ticket, flew up to Alaska, took that course, um, passed it, of course. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and the rest is history, man. I, he said, yeah, we'll hire you and we can't wait to see you. And went up there for uh, the like setup of the camp where they have to, at the end of the season, they winterize the entire camp. Mm-hmm. They make put up bare boards, board up the windows, everything for the harsh winter. Yeah. Um, so we went up there to take all that down, set the camp up, get it ready for clients to come yeah. out and uh, fish with us. And uh, for that first month I was there, I, I worked straight for a full month and I was grinding away, learning the learning the trade, learning how to drive a jet boat out up there on yeah. a moving river, fast flowing river. Right. Um, and after about a month of doing that and working in the kitchen, they brought me up to the guide level and I started taking people out for a week and that's awesome it was amazing it's one of the best yeah. experiences i've ever had yeah i mean it's got to be uh, a pretty pretty big wake-up call too i mean just dropping everything going to alaska to be a guide now like yeah, one man. question i ask is like how did you prepare you know what i mean it's mm-hmm. like was that your first guiding experience that was as my far first as foreign experience. water goes yeah, yeah yeah man so to prepare really i just got my gear together i i found some flies that I needed to, to have. And I, I called a couple of the guides that had worked up worked there in up the past there. summers mm-hmm. just to kind of like see what to expect really. Right. Mm-hmm. And they were telling me, you know, you're going to be working hard. And if you get to the, to the position where, uh, where they are comfortable with you taking people out or comfortable with you driving the boat, that's really the biggest, like, uh, requirement requirement mm-hmm. yeah is mm-hmm. to be able to drive that jet boat and have those clients feel yeah, comfortable feel while safe. you're driving the jet boat and feel safe with you captaining them yeah um yeah. so they gave me a couple trial runs while i was working in the kitchen like some one of the guides was busy one day trying to bring in some uh we were bringing in lumber to build a new uh, lodge mm-hmm. um because the previous one had burned down the <laughs> year back actually the week i was there it burnt down <laughs> um so we were rebuilding this this lodge um and we were bringing in lumber from uh knack which is about oh, okay. 30 miles or so away from where we are on the river and we have this big massive jet boat that can haul ton of uh ton of like weight and ton of lumber and he was having to go down to Naknek to pick that up. And they said, hey, will you take his clients out for the day? And I said, yeah, I definitely will. And we had a great day. We caught a couple fish, you know. It wasn't yeah. a stellar day by any means, but just the conversations we had, the guys were like, yeah, we yeah. really like Sam. Like, yeah. he did a great job out there. We felt safe. And that's when they were kind of like, okay, he can do this, you yeah. know. And yeah. and. I felt that way as well. I felt, okay, I can do this. You know? Gave you some confidence. Yeah. 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 That's sick, man. Yeah. I mean, and also too, like I'm, I'm sure the first time you went up there with, with your dad on that trip or even just to go visit, um, you, you notice the fishing, right? It's spectacular. spectacular. Like, I mean, what, as far as you being up there, you know, a couple of years now, what are like some of the, the stuff that you just didn't expect to see as far as like the fishing up there, maybe like patterns as far as like, you know, different species, um, what was new to you and what didn't you expect? Yeah, man. So the grayling for me really grayling. stood out. Uh, they're one of the most beautiful fish there are They They call them the, uh, sailfish in the north yeah um <laughs> arctic yeah. sailfish oh yeah because uh, they have a really big beautiful blue fin on their back of the or on their that dorsal the dorsal <laughs> yeah. yeah man and uh the the thing that really surprised me about those is they'll they'll take a dry flight anytime yeah. like any time <laughs> of the day rain or shine like genuinely they yeah. will take a dry fly anytime i've caught them in the pouring rain throwing wow. a dry fly a big stimulator over the top of these holes and they'll just come up and blow all the way up out of the water to get these flies <laughs> and man that was one of the best best fishing experiences i've ever had man yeah. like if you're having a bad day out on the water go to a grayling yeah. hole yeah. And you'll, <laughs> you'll have a good day yeah, and you're... we get massive grayling out there too like a trophy grayling is about 18 inches Damn. and we're constantly catching 18 plus inch, inch Jeez, grayling. Jeez. it's one of the best fisheries uh for grayling. for grayling in all of alaska it's a lot to do with the the water like clarity oh, and quality. quality uh grayling require 
the purest, cleanest water in the world. Mm-hmm. And this is some of the purest and cleanest water in the world. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, man. yeah I mean, it's you get all the salmon there too, the yeah. trout, uh, and then just grayling to top it off. Yeah, yeah. Man. Talk about the trout, man. The Let's... trout. Oh, dude. <laughs> <sighs> so beginning of the season is best trout fishing. So okay. like June opener, it opens in uh, June 8th, yeah. uh, I believe the river, just June 8th or 9th. And that first week that you're there is some of the best trout fishing you will ever have anywhere in the world. Size, numbers, everything you get Mm -hmm. there. So most of the fishing that we're doing then, we're throwing big, meaty streamers. So articulated, uh, we can't run double hooks, so we clip the front hook. Mm -hmm. Um, But big articulated streamers, black black and white, white and olive mm-hmm. any yeah. of those kind of colors really work well and uh you'll just go down to a hole you we typically fish below us which is sure. very different from most fishing traditional yeah, fly yeah. fishing where you're working upstream on a river mm-hmm. we, we work down right um a lot of what you're doing is swinging stuff yes mm-hmm. exactly so we're swinging big flies and um uh, you'll go into a hole and really first cast you take there <laughs> if there's a fish in that hole it's going to eat that fly yeah. mm-hmm. they, they really don't see a lot of presentations so everything that they see they're just gonna it's attack. hard to resist just yeah go after it man yeah yeah that's sick man that that is really cool yeah and the uh the salmon fishing that when the sockeyes start to run they, they start running in like late june early july and okay. run kind of until right around the end of july um, and once those kind of push into our river, the, the trout get a little displaced and spread out. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit harder to find them, but we're still catching 25, 26 inch fish, yeah. um, two footers plus, um, Jeez, which dude. is just unbelievable for trout fishing. Yeah. Like our average is probably 22 inches, uh, which is a trophy <laughs> fish in the lower 48. Yeah. Um, that's, that's amazing, man. Yeah. But once those salmon start pushing in, then we're really just targeting them for most of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll target them for that, that morning. We'll catch our limit. Um, I'll be there filet them for about an hour. Um, sometimes doesn't take that long, (laughs) but, uh, we'll be filleting them and then, uh, bag them up and then we'll go and try and find some trout at the end of the day. And, uh, typically we can find some, some pretty nice fish. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And then, uh, later in the season is when the, uh, different species of salmon start coming in. You get your, uh, pinks on even years and, uh, silvers towards early August, uh, late, uh, July, Mm -hmm. um, as well as chums. Chums. Yeah, Yeah. man. But, uh, I'd have to say that my favorite fighting fish is silvers or, uh, kings. Kings, dude. Yeah, man. We get kings (laughs) right at the beginning of the year. They start pushing up before the sockeye and everything, mm-hmm. but it just takes them a while to get to where we are on the river. We're, uh, we're at mile 52 on the okay. Alagnac. So we're about 52 miles from the coast. Uh, okay. which it means it takes them about two or three weeks to get up to where we are. And once they're, they're around where we are, they're already starting to get a little blushed because they've been into, uh, the fresh water for a while, just a little bit. already starting to turn, turn color just a little bit mm-hmm. but uh we get about two two or three weeks to target those fish yeah. and uh before the season closes for them are there spots um holes rather where like you know species are overlapping you have some uh where you have a few, a few different salmon or some of the same salmon yeah man uh, maybe rainbows mixed in there too definitely definitely so later in the season when uh the sockeye have kind of, kind of already moved through the river system mm-hmm. gotten into the lakes that they're going to um you start seeing uh, these chums, pinks, and uh, silvers holding up in the same holes. And what you also find when, if you go on a fly-out trip um, up towards uh, Battle Creek, these creeks that are up above the lakes that feed our river. Okay. uh, Excuse me. That's where the... uh, the trout are all pushing up to. That's where they kind of uh, get displaced to. They follow those sockeye up to where their spawning grounds are okay. and just wait for them to drop their the eggs. eggs. Yeah. And once those eggs start dropping, then you just, the bead bite is just it's on. Crazy. You'll you'll see just a sea of red in these rivers. Okay. There's just, just thick of sockeye. And then you'll see a little brown, or like a little gray bullet behind them, you know, just, huge and that's a huge trout just waiting for those eggs to drop. You'll just throw a rig right over the top of these salmon 
and just wait for it to hit that trout and boom, you're on, man. Wow, man. Yeah. 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 Speaking, you know, yeah, like speaking of abundance of, well, first of all, that's awesome, man. That's, it's cool that you've gotten to experience that at such a young age too. Yeah, I mean, man. not a lot of people get to go up to Alaska and guide at what, 23, yes, 24. Sir. I mean, yeah, just man. like, it's, it's crazy, but, um, yeah, you know, encompassing all of the, the fish species and fish diversity there, it's, you know, let's talk about bears, man. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about <laughs> bears up there. So uh, I'm sure that was a wake up call for you too when you first yeah, went up. That so. was one of the biggest uh, like hurdles to get over mm-hmm. was interacting with bears because mm-hmm. where we are in Alaska is the bariest spot in the world. Yeah. I don't know if that's correct, but bariest. The bariest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we get, we probably have a couple hundred bears just in our. <sighs> That's couple mile square mile stretch kind of scary. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah man and they're they're really only looking for salmon though right, for like food, yeah. once the once the salmon hit the water you really don't see many bears at the beginning of the season mm-hmm. um it really once those salmon start hitting the uh the river they know something about it the yeah. bears know and then they start showing up and you'll just see probably 20 to 30 different bears every single day just working their way up and down the river looking Mm -hmm. for salmon you'll see them jumping into the water you get so many spectacular shots there's people that come out there just to photograph or to photograph bears yeah i was about to say didn't you tell me that's like a hot spot yeah man that's like the spot to go if you're trying to catch a video or picture of a bear jumping into the water or fishing or just doing its bear thing Mm -hmm. that's awesome man man. yeah Mm -hmm. i mean i've seen some cool shots of you showing me of bears jump in full on in the water or have a salmon in their mouth hanging out yeah and i (laughs) the craziest thing happened to me last year i actually saw a a grizzly bear take down a fully grown moose uh, in the river um that was one of the wildest wildest moments of my life i I was actually guiding my dad that week yeah and uh we were out there we were down river about i'd say 20 miles or so Mm -hmm. and i had we had just fi- we were just finishing up fi- uh, fish in this area, and my dad was down there fishing, throwing a streamer for some for some salmon, throwing a big articulated pink and white streamer with some flash on it. And uh, after a couple minutes, he's like, "All right, I'm I'm gonna sit down and take a rest. Uh, you take a couple casts." And yeah. <laughs> I'm being for real. The very first cast I took after he had gave him, given me the rod, I feel a whoom. And then a whoom, 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 my rod just starts bending and going crazy. I'm like, dad, dad, get the net. <laughs> this is the fish. This is the one. And, and sure enough, it was a king salmon. And I Jeez. fought him for about five, ten minutes or so. Probably was longer than that. Yeah. And just trying to get it into the net. And my dad's trying to scoop it up. He's not a guide. So he's going right from the tail, you know, oh, scooping geez. under him. Um, but eventually we got that fish landed and it was about a 25 pound King salmon. I'm guessing um, your PV, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my my personal best <laughs> on a fly rod too. Yeah. Um, it was w- one of the craziest things that ever happened to me cause he had just fished the entire hole and it took me one cast to find that wow. fish. And I look at him and I'm like, well, I don't see how this day gets any better <laughs> whatsoever, you know? And he, he says the exact same thing. He's like, yeah, let's. Let's pack it up and head on home, you know? And it was about three o'clock at this point. So we still had a good two hours of our day left. So if we wanted to stay down river, we could have and kept fishing. Right. But we decided, you know what, we'll call it early and head on up. And on our way up to the, uh, to the lodge, about a mile away from the lodge, I see this moose just standing in the river, just standing there. And I was like, what the heck is going on with that? And I kind of looked down, downstream of him and I see this bear kind of, sneaking up through through the the grass and through the bushes of this island right behind this bear and i was like man dad something crazy is about about to happen happen. right now (laughs) yeah and so i pull out my phone i start recording this and sure enough this bear stalks up to the moose chases him and then actually catches the moose on the river or on the uh, island right next to him and takes it down and wow. we saw the entire interaction i was able to catch it on camera as well yeah dude this thing was i mean for those that don't know this thing was picked up by like nature versus metal oh yeah like this thing yeah. is huge like uh outdoor out- life yeah, yeah i mean just also like uh grueling videos of, yeah. of animals taking down other animals it's wild so. I, I don't think there's any other footage in the world like no. like that seeing the yeah the full catch and like stalking, catching, take down and killing of a moose in a river 
by a bear. bear. It's <laughs> only things you hear about in stories. I mean, and dude, there's no other way that you could have gotten closer to. Like no. you were right in the river. I mean, you couldn't have been on land. I'm, I'm yeah. sure it would have been probably too dangerous. Yeah, but I like, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have been able to see it either because this yeah. bear catches the moose and floats about a mile down river with, with, the, with the moose. Geez, you know, he, he was trying to, once he had, had killed it, it he tried to pull it onto the bank and was trying to fight the current and trying to get it up to a place that he could actually eat it at. Um, but he couldn't find that spot. So he tried for about 30 minutes just to pull it onto the, onto the bank, but ended up giving up and just kind of let go of it and rode down the, the current with it into a small little side eddy that he was able to pull it up into and finally start eating on it. Dude, you know, just getting a little off topic, just like we get our food quick, right? Uh, just humans, man. We're able to just get food like yeah, that nowadays. Go to the supermarket. Yeah. <laughs> but dude, this bear, I mean, 30 minutes to just get it up on shore yeah. and like not even start eating it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you're really, it's really detrimenting the bear at that point trying to get this elk especially getting in that fast moving water that yeah. current and pulling them back out it's yeah just, what a sight dude and that, man, that bear he had probably about an hour to get his first little bites in on that meal and mm-hmm. then he was chased away by uh some bigger bears that were able to smell sorry. it bears can smell for miles away just and uh these bears were they smelled it and they ended up scaring him off of the uh kill and the biggest bear of our area was probably about a thousand pound bear uh, was just sitting on that that carcass for the next day and a half, but they had it picked to the bone mm. in three days. Wow, it was gone in three That's days crazy, completely. Man. It's cool that you get to experience that. I mean, not only just the fishing, but like it everything the whole yeah, ecosystem the right wildlife yeah, up there is i mean insane yeah that's that's awesome man so like yeah just what an experience to be fishing catching a huge king and then like <laughs> a site that like no one may never yeah, see uh, ever see again exactly yeah. um just taking it's down that moose that's really a once in a lifetime thing to see yeah that's yeah. cool man yeah. um so yeah a- ata man that that's a really cool place you know i've talked to you about you know prospectively working there yeah, hopefully yeah. so i'm i'm super excited to hopefully join you on that on that journey yeah. of uh, maybe we, seeing a, a, a bear at least of yeah, course you're just, gonna see a bear <laughs> i can assure you that. yeah very cool man that's 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 something i look forward to i, I haven't seen a bear yeah. i mean it's probably not that close ever oh, and you'll so. see them you'll see them close yeah. <laughs> yeah i've had some interactions where they're closer than five feet ten wow. feet from me wow. yeah so how many uh let's talk about the lodge for a little bit you know ata it's it's a big lodge um how many people work there you know what's the experience like um yeah i'd say there's about 20 20 or so staff staff members okay. on hand every every summer okay just about that um there's about 12 12 or so guides that we have Mm -hmm. um and about eight to ten camp staff slash uh operations managers up there yeah and uh the community up there we're all buddies it's all a we're working towards the same goal right and we're we're all trying to make the best experience for the people that come up there and stay with us Mm -hmm. um we're really trying to make that their best experience in alaska and something that they can go home and tell their friends and family about yeah. and say how great of a time they had at ATA Lodge and how welcome they felt, how it's a home away from home. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I, I consider those people my family now. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, man. And I'm yeah. sure, I mean, when people get up there, just already astonished at like where they're at. Right? Yeah, the, man. The scenic. Most people that come up there are just like, wow, I'm just so happy to, to be, be here. here. <laughs> you know, just to, just to be here and experience what alaska has to offer i mean yeah because first you drive in or fly into anchorage and you're you're flying out to this yeah remote, man. so like you gotta lodge, fly yeah. to anchorage then you gotta fly to king salmon mm-hmm. and then you gotta get on a even smaller little bush plane to fly wow. out to our lodge because we're about 20 miles from the nearest civili- civilization, civilization yeah the nearest town yeah um so Everything's and you have to get in. to yeah, yeah you have to get to the lodge with the plane uh you can't drive there it's all tundra and wilderness in between us and King Salmon. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, man. What an experience that I hope to, you know, hopefully be up there soon yeah, with man. you and experience I'm, I'm excited that. for that. You're yeah. going to have a great time, man. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited, dude. That's cool. 
All right, yeah, Alaska, dude. What what a what an experience. Um, we'll probably definitely touch back on that in future podcasts for sure. But yeah, um, let's definitely. let's talk about back home for a little bit. Um, you know, fly fishing back here after our recent rain. You know, we touched on white bass a little bit in the beginning. Yeah, man. but um, favorite yeah. time of the year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's time to get those stringers ready. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> um, you know, it it was tough last year out here near Somerville. We we didn't have much water. No, right? we no, didn't. we didn't get. Any, really any rain during yeah. the uh, spring winter time uh last uh last year last year um so uh, most of these fish just kind of went up into the mouths of these creeks mm-hmm. where they typically would run all the way up to the you know the Rip. shallows of right. it to right. spawn but they ended up spawning right below these creeks and yeah. really never made their way into them into so it. we couldn't target them as well exactly um but this year man we've gotten a ton of rain in the yeah. past couple of weeks yeah. Um, which I really think is going to start pushing the fish up, and they have in yeah. certain creeks um, yeah. around Somerville. Oh yeah, and um, it's it's weird. We've you know within this uh, within that week, we kind of got all that rainfall. You know, we had uh, the males up in there and the females push up in there and yeah. seeing spawning activity. That mm-hmm. was all within that kind of like week. We got rain. It, it just happened so yeah, fast, so fast, man. So and, and um, not. Not early, but earlier than years past. Yeah, um, yeah. I also think you know that that cold spell we got. That yeah, you know, I think the temperature really played a, a big mm-hmm. role in in spawning. And that cold spell and then warming up quickly it, after right, that. Mm-hmm. It, it, I definitely think that helped with the fish moving yeah. up into our uh, creeks. Yeah, we we went out to Nails uh, last week and had a pretty good time. Yeah, um, so that was cool. Water's still kind of dirty, um, but yeah, it's like also too like with Yewa. I've noticed that a lot of the fish are uh, a bit bigger in Yewa Creek than, than in Nails, yeah. which I think a lot of a lot of the fish are starting to move around a bit. They're starting to get more comfortable with the creeks now that they have water and they're coming down a little bit. But yeah, I mean, when we were out there last week, you know, we saw a bunch of spawning activity. A bunch of spawning activity, so, yeah. um, right on the, uh, on, the, on the banks. On the banks, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. people... Even in the flowing water, man. Yeah. They were spawning in the moving current. Yeah, yeah. Which is wild. We were trying to target them, but they weren't interested in it at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And already seeing the crowds uh, start to get out. So it's cool to see everybody, you know, be, a lot of people have been waiting for this around around this this area. You yeah, know? yeah. Last year was just kind of like a hit and miss. And then this year, I, I feel like a lot of people are going to, you know, start making their way out oh, here. Yeah. A lot of people come from Austin and Houston yeah. just to target these fish. And people here. are wanting to get on them because they yeah. didn't get any last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's one of the best tasting fish, too, in my oh, opinion. Yeah. We're, yeah. We're How do you cute. cook it? How do, how, you, do I, <laughs> or like, how do I cook it? I, I've cooked it a couple different ways, actually. My favorite, though, is just to kind of pan sear it in butter. Okay. Um, I'll hit it with this uh, Greek seasoning. I can't remember the name off the top of my Some head. Some Greek seasoning. Yeah, okay. man. And, Mrs. Uh, Dash, by chance? <laughs> it's not that one. I want to say it's... I don't know. It's a yellow and white bottle. Okay. Um, it's probably Mrs. Dash, man. It could be. <laughs> um, but uh, that's one of my favorite ways. Or just... Uh, bread it up with some uh just some flour and yeah uh, throw some salt and pepper on it and a little bit of cajun seasoning and damn and yeah pan fry and some butter i know some guys who actually like you know got a fork and pulled the meat off of the bones or, or okay, the, you yeah. know and have like done like a little jambalaya with it yeah. almost but through sausage mm-hmm. through you know the white bass and then some rice and it, i mean damn, it looked really good. good yeah so and i i have heard a recipe i was talking with a an Asian lady uh, yeah. on the river, and she oh, was okay. telling me about some recipes that she she uses to cook for them. And oh, uh, wow. she's telling me that if you get some oil and just really heat it up super hot, and just pour it onto the skin of the uh, fish after you descale them, uh, it crisps up the skin really nice, cooks the meat, and mm. it's one of the most delicious ways to have them. Yeah, yeah, yeah man. that that that's definitely probably something I'll have to try because yeah. that sounds unique but really good. I like yeah. the skin on it. So oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Oh, one cool, of the man. tastiest fish and man the the bones they just melt away yeah it's you they're cook small them. they're yeah, very they're small, small so. so you really don't have to worry about any of the bones other than the rib bones yeah getting those out yeah. yeah let's talk about how we were fishing for these white bass you know it's smaller creek fishing um it, it's a lot different than fishing for white bass in a lake right you find oh, a yeah. school of them you're cast into them and you track them on a little sonar but you know when you walk up to these creeks you know for someone that's maybe has, hasn't fly fished for uh, white bass or fly fished creeks at all. What, what should they be looking for when they go out uh, and trying to target these white bass? 
What I like to look for when I'm targeting white bass is is moving water that slows down into a deep pool. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be anything from a log jam to a, the bend of a river, just any kind of deep water that they they could be holding in right into some current. Into um, some current. Because they kind of like to be in a, a bit of current um, while they're moving up the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll typically spawn in uh, that slower moving water right. that's still got a little bit of flow. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really just like to throw in a some kind of white clouser streamer really anything white with a little bit of flash on it mm -hmm. and that's lights out every single day yeah um, they'll, they'll go after it yeah um, and something we've noticed too is that they're a little deeper you know yeah, maybe yeah. like longer leader uh lips a few split shots above your fly yeah, yeah. or something to get it down i wouldn't say i wouldn't use sinking line i'd right. still use floating line mm -hmm. but uh yeah definitely something that gets you down a little bit deeper a but bit deeper. you really got to watch out for uh snags and, yeah uh like just trees underwater or anything you'll most days that I'm out white bass fishing I'm gonna be losing <laughs> two or three flies at the minimum yeah those guys like to just you know in this current there's there's these down trees and these down uh you know branches that they just like to sit in and then just come out and yeah eat. so yeah. yeah that's that's something that if you do plan on going out make sure you have a handful of clausers oh yeah handful of backups that yeah. you can you can uh you can't just do it with one fly yeah i've had very rare days where i don't lose a fly yeah exactly uh, yeah and a lot of the, the clausers you know we use are just simple dumbbell bead eyes s yeah. something a little bit heavier i know they make like some lead dumbbell eyes um i've seen those are, which are really good um and just your regular 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 hook um you know size six size eight yeah. and uh yeah some bucktail and some flashing that's all it that's mm -hmm. all it takes that's but, really all it takes um there's a, there's a cool fly that uh jama one of the the fishermen I, that actually taught me everything there is to know about white bass fishing somerville yeah. in that area has this fly he calls the magical clouser and it imitates it, like i kid you not imitates the the small shiners that are or small uh minnows that are in the creeks in, yeah. in somerville and to the like to like the line the everything man wow. it's it, it's really cool it's it's like a little a gray and white clouser with a little bit of blue fat bla uh, blue flashing but okay. yeah. super cool fly and i you know witnessed this witness this guy just like throw this fly out there and pull in every single cast <laughs> man and wow. it's just like Jeez, yeah. So um, gray and white may be the key if you're if you're looking for the right color or yeah. whatever. So yeah, take that into account. But but cool. Yeah, we plan to get out sometime this weekend. Um, you know, of course, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be focusing on white bass and tracking them and seeing where they're they're moving to, so we can get out. I think we have a club outing sometime soon awesome. as well, so yeah. we can get out and looking chase forward to it that. It's club. a great place to learn how to fly fish. Yeah, and you, it's not and just just to, just to be able to hone your perfection or hone your craft, craft uh, yeah. and be able to deal with certain situations because a lot of the times you're casting in some pretty brushy areas you don't right. have much of a back cast area so that's exactly what i was going to say is yeah. it's a little bit difficult to learn and, and yeah, that uh, is true yeah. and and uh, but you know if you can do that uh, you, that can carry over to a lot of stuff bass definitely, fishing definitely. trout fishing so i when i mean when i say like easy to fish or a great place to learn it, it just numbers of numbers. fish you're gonna catch mm -hmm. fish when you go out there right you know it's it might not be the easiest to cast in or easiest to actually get it to them but when you do find that spot to get it to them mm -hmm. it's amazing man yeah oh yeah, yeah. And, and it's uh, a great place to learn and practice your roll cast since there is that yes, kind of cover behind you mm -hmm. um, and just being able to get the specifics of fly fishing down yeah and a lot of people are turned off uh because of like the clarity right the, the muddy water but yeah, what we notice is like a lot of them are sitting deeper i don't think a lot of them are seen very well mm. once this clears up though it's it's on it's yeah. like very on <laughs> so yeah and i um, i for one never knew texas had clear water yeah. creeks <laughs> or clear water just anywhere yeah and certain times of the year once the water has gone down the rains have kind of stopped a little bit and uh the bass are still in there but uh mm -hmm. the water really clears, clears up, up and you can see to the right down to the bottom basically yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and just it amazed me the last year yeah. being able to see that and see yeah. the diversity of texas yeah and seeing oh, sure. all of what texas has to offer mm -hmm. as well as when we were on the colorado river man that was a <laughs> that was too cool yeah man how, how was it you know I, I totally forgot to bring that up but how was it catching your first guadalupe bass dude i'd when we were going on that trip, I, I was gonna, I was gonna be happy if I caught one. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't really expecting to catch more than one or two. Mm -hmm. 
and we caught probably 30. Yeah, and dude. It was, that was what a day. Amazing day. Um, yeah. One of the best days of fishing I've ever had. Yeah. I mean, genuinely. It, I mean, it, it, that, that goes for anyone. Like, you guys want to get on a Guadalupe Bass, man, the lower Colorado is the, yeah, the place to do that it. That is now. the place to do it. It fluctuates. You know, checking water levels and checking the weather is important, but. Um, the, the way that we were fishing for these, these squads, man, it's so fun. It's, yeah, you, you know, you're fishing moving water. Yeah. So it really reminded me of fishing in Alaska. Yeah. Like that's, that's one of the reasons I loved it so much is because we were actually swinging flies for yeah, them mm-hmm. and fishing moving water, moving which, which water. we, you don't get a lot in Texas. At yeah. least I've never done a lot yeah. in Texas. Mm-hmm. I've mostly fished still water yeah. uh, mm-hmm. here, but just doing that, that one day, I'm I'm ready to go back out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. And it's crazy, man. These quads are gorgeous. Yeah. You know, they 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 may not be all of, you know, 10 or 12 inches, but yeah, yeah. you know, the smaller ones and and the way they're colored up is awesome. Yeah. And just to think that's our fish. Yeah. You know, that's Texas's that fish. That is our native fish, so, our state fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I'm hoping to get on a few projects where we can, you know, do something to work towards the conservation protection yeah, of them. So, yeah. maybe partner with parks and wildlife or uh you know our local chapter or something like that we'll see yeah but but yeah cool plans for that um all right man yeah your position as far as you know you're an officer now you're our fundraising yeah. chair um i kind of like to ask you of you know what what plans do you have as far as fundraising goes for this semester and um what do you hope to see out of the club and the club members yeah so as far as fundraising goes i'd like to do some uh some fundraising while we're at these uh, shows, such as the Fly Fishing Festival and uh, New Braunfels and the one up in Mesquite, um, mm-hmm. I'd like to set up some some kind of raffle system. Yeah. What I we spoke about this a yeah. little while ago, but uh, I was thinking a couple of members of our club would actually tie up some flies, and mm-hmm. we'd make a collection of a fly box that uh, features our favorite flies that we like to use in Texas or yeah. wherever for certain fish, and uh, auction that off while we're uh, at at the trout fest and uh fly fishing festival that's, that's yeah, a good man. idea man i think it, it, it you know somebody getting a box uh with a variety of flies hand tied by some of our officers and yeah, members man. would be cool people so. would people would love that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. uh i'm also trying to get some things set up for uh giveaways or uh mm-hmm. like just extra raffles just to earn the club a little bit of extra money to be mm-hmm. able to purchase the things that we need for our members yeah you yeah know. and we have a great program that will help us out with that man we, we can uh definitely get some fundraising going yeah um you know something that i wanted to touch on too about fundraising is that we may have this cool opportunity to show an f3t film which is a yeah, fly fishing film tour um film and so that's in the works uh we're we're trying to get that together with trout unlimited coast of five but if we can pull that off that'd be really yeah really cool that would um, be great for it'd the be club, a great, great fun for the community yeah as well. yeah, yeah yeah and so um you know like like i said i believe that you really can't watch these films uh other than you know by purchasing them or by you know going to one of the showings that's near you yeah, yeah so um yeah what you know what a cool experience if we can if we can do that and uh it'd be a good opportunity to fundraise too so, yeah yeah man. um we're looking at you know maybe even hosting that at the uh the plaza theater in brian yeah. kind of make a cool aesthetic type of scene uh, maybe have like a panel discussion by one of the guys yeah um, that does the film so yeah we'll, we'll kind of talk about more logistics on that uh when it plays out when it gets closer but that's hopefully something that we plan on doing soon um yeah man i want to touch on too uh you know we're still partnered with science on the fly which is a uh th- they're an organization that uh is basically promoting clean water for local creeks and and, and local rivers um a lot of a few places here in Texas are, are partnered with. Uh, I know Living Waters is, is one of them. Um, yeah. There's a few other places, but I think that's something we should definitely uh, keep doing. Um, it promotes clean water. You know, we do testing every month um, just to see what's in our waterways or if we got some bad stuff. You know, in while doing this last year, we had a uh, a spill that killed a lot of fish in one of our creeks here, oh, Carter's man. Creek, and yeah. so. We were able to see that, and just because we were getting on the creeks, we were able to notice that and bring mm. it up to um, some officials and say, hey, you know, what's kind of going on here? There's a bunch of dead fish here. And, yeah, and there was a, a spill that, that was uh, located upstream that hmm. kind of it, it had closed off, but that little spill killed a, a lot of the population wow. of sunfish and, and little bass that were in the creek we fished. So, yeah. um, 
you know, just, you know, if we weren't doing that, I feel like we wouldn't have noticed it. But no, now that no. we, you know, because we're out there. out there, we're in the field. We're, we're, see, we're the, seeing it. Yeah. 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 We see so, it firsthand. I, we're the ones that it affects too. Exactly. Yeah. Other than the fish that are <laughs> dying <laughs> off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> IP. yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's something I want to continue to do. It's, it's definitely a job, but I feel like we have some dedicated members and dedicated officers that can uh, take, take that role. And, um, you know, I think Barack Ryan's up for for doing some stuff like yeah, that, so yeah. we'll, we'll get to talking about. Excited to see what he has in the future. Yeah, yeah, that'd store. be cool. So, um, another thing with uh, before we we kind of close up here, um, about to reach an hour or so, but um, yeah, industry recognition. I put this on here as one of our topics because. Um, in our TU Costa Five meeting we had the other day, that's kind of the things that our new coordinator. Um, is wanting to bring up and promote in, in, our, in our clubs around the, the U.S. is um, a lot of kids, a lot of college students are wondering, you know, what, what can I do to be in the industry? Is yeah. this even possible yeah. for, for this to happen? And I think um, by bringing in this kind of gateway um, of speakers, of industry professionals talking about their experience getting into the industry, um, it will encourage and help us to kind of say, oh, you know, I can do it this yeah, way or I can do it myself. I can do, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think, um, with, with bringing that into TU Costa five and hopefully our club personally, we can, we can, uh, hopefully motivate some people. Um, cause I'm sure, you know, there's gotta be some, some other people out there like us that are very excited and, uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. So. All right. Sorry. We got cut off for a bit, but, um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm excited for, uh, you know, that, that industry presence to be there. Um, hopefully some guest speakers and, uh, you know, the, the festivals kind of do that in, in themselves, right? We, we meet with, uh, a lot of guides, a lot of people from the industry yeah. at these festivals yeah. and get to talk to them, uh, either one-on-one -on -one or visit a panel discussion that they, they, uh, bring up. So, um, really cool. Like, uh, I know this, this year at Trout Fest, we're going to be seeing Landon Mayer. Um, uh, Pat Dorsey, uh, owns a blue coat angler and, and, uh, evergreen colorado mm. i mean writer just amazing fisherman author just crazy crazy cool guy yeah um i know tom might be making it back tom rosenbauer from orvis he mm. may be making it back to the fly fest and tom, remember, yeah it's, i remember those days when i was learning to fly fish <laughs> those were the videos i Dude, watched it was so surreal because i met tom last year at the fly fish and brew fest and it was it was weird because you know you kind of look up to the you know I, I kind of look up to these guys as idols right and yeah. it's just like wow you're you're really cool and when you when you get to meeting with these professionals in the industry it's it's almost just like you know hey what's up man yeah. and you're you're just kind of like a friend of them they're it's, real people yeah you know? and you know that yeah. was kind of like meeting Tom we you know one of the first questions he asked me is like you know where do y'all fish in Texas and it's like <laughs> we it it is kind of funny because you know it's just like you know, we have a lot of places to fish and it, it was just explaining it to him, you know, something he's probably, uh, you know, never heard of. And it, it's really cool to just to talk to them and, yeah, and get to know yeah. them. So, and I've through ATA lodge and through yeah. working up there, I was able to meet a couple people within the industry. Yeah. The, uh, Bob White, he's yeah. a, a big, big artist and a painter uh, okay. of wildlife, uh, really anything outdoorsy. Uh, and he was featured in, a, he used to, paint for the uh, cover of uh i believe it was uh, outdoor life or field and stream Whoa, um, wow. as okay. well as john gearick uh fly fishing writer yeah um, yeah uh, both of those guys very down-to-earth people and yeah you just see that within the industry everyone we're just normal people you yeah know? Mm -hmm. we're, we're just trying to make a living within that industry and yeah. uh meet other people yeah and it's uh, cool that you know a lot of what keeps us in this fly fishing community is passion. Yeah. Like it's nothing but passion that I hear from these guys. Um, Chris Johnson, Landon Mayer, uh, you know, Tom himself, there's true passion yeah. in people yeah. about what they love to do. And they, and, they love doing yeah, it. Yeah. They love doing it. Yeah. You know, so it's not work to them at this point. No, so. not at all. <laughs> but, but yeah, man, um, I'm glad you came on today. Um, it, it was, it was great talking with you. Yeah. I know we have some really cool plans for, for this upcoming year. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really hoping to be joining you up this summer in Alaska and we can make some really cool yeah, man. films. We can make some yeah. really cool, uh, get some really cool photos and, and just, yeah, have an experience, have yeah. a, have a summer. So. It's an experience, man. Yeah. For I'm excited. Sure. 
yeah well we're gonna close it up here uh thanks for tuning in guys to another uh, episode but um, you guys know where to find us we're on instagram um, if you uh, haven't been to one of our meetings they're every other thursday right now in wfes uh, wildlife fisheries um, building uh, room 411 so come stop by say what's up and uh, yeah let's talk fly fishing but in the meantime um Thanks, and thanks, yeah, Sam, for, for coming on. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Yeah, uh, we'll catch this you next awesome. time. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Y'all have a good one.